drop the survey link into the, the comments. If anyone, I, I think pretty much everyone here has taken it. So, but just in case, so if you wanted to take a look at it again, um, yeah, that's about it. Cool, cool, cool. And then uh, also, if you have any recipes that you want featured in our newsletter, because um, Haven sent that newsletter to everybody about is that every other uh, week, every month. Every month. Um, so we're trying to feature brew club recipes. So if you guys have a recipe um, award winning or just something that needs to be out there, uh, feel free to, to shoot it over to Haven and he will feature it. Um, and I think that's all the business unless I'm missing something. Oh, uh, memberships. The other thing, um, we're, we are a free club and we have every intention of remaining free to everybody club. Um, but there are some things that are cool to do if you have money, like get off of Facebook rooms and some of those things uh and so uh we, we are gonna have come up with uh, some membership guidelines here in the upcoming weeks months um to try to figure out what that includes what what the perks are there will be some perks we'll try to make it worth your while um but we're trying to figure some of that stuff out and we're not trying to price anybody out of the club again everything you do now is going to be free we're hoping to keep a lot of the stuff that we've been doing for free for free as well um but we want to add some extra perks and give us maybe a little extra capital to do some club stuff so um, so we can act like a, a big boy club instead of just, you know, no money. So anyway, so look look forward to that coming out, and we'll try to get that information out to you. Um, the Imperial Yeast, uh, maybe one of the – right now it's a lottery because we don't have any paid, but it may be um, just because we're limited on how much yeast we get from Imperial. That may be a, a, cr a club paid tier sponsorship kind of thing. So um, but there's some other stuff we're going to keep for free. I think Lalamon will probably keep for free, but we still have some things to work through on that. Um, but without anything else, we have uh, from brewlosophy.com, from the Brew Lab, from Oregon State University, from used to be a lawyer, from used to be a blue owl, we've got Cade. And we can't hear, I can't hear Cade. I think you muted yourself, Cade. There we go. And so there now I'm go. unmuted. <laughs> yeah, this yeah, I was saying that actually kind of sounds like a lot um, whenever you say it like that, although it doesn't didn't feel like it at the time. But yeah, wow, now it seems like I'm doing a lot of stuff. Well, you used to, right, at least. But um, mm -hmm. but no, that's awesome. So um, cool. So do you want to give an intro? I think most of us know who you are, but we're, I'm more than happy to, to give you an opportunity to intro yourself. Uh, sure. I mean, yeah, I think most people hopefully know me. I mean, this is the Brew Club, so hopefully y'all are listening to the podcasts um, uh, and reading the articles. But yeah, uh, I, so yeah, right now I'm a master's student at Oregon State uh, working with Dr. Tom Shellhammer, um, doing some hop related stuff. I was actually uh, today um, running a hop pelletizer. So I've got like hop oil underneath my fingernails and like stuck in my arm hair. Uh, which is really gross and, and smelly. Uh, but yeah, it's been fun. I was a lawyer for seven and a half, almost eight years. Uh, made the switch over to Blue Owl Brewing, where I was a cellar person. Worked in there, um, you know, worked in there uh, cleaning tanks and racking beer and moving moving liquid around, working on the packaging line, all that stuff. Uh, and then moved, made the move up here to Oregon State, studying beer. So yeah, it's been quite a quite a career but that's me oh yeah and i host the brew lab podcast and co-host uh the brewlosophy podcast and contribute podcast. to brewlosophy experiments brew like you said so like yep anybody have any questions i mean i've got a bad one to start with awesome love bad questions <laughs> okay uh who's keeping it weirder portland or austin Ooh, you, uh, austin keeps it weirder I like it. Really? I, I I miss Austin. I'm I've been up to Portland a couple times and just haven't gotten to know that city uh, as well. It seems like uh, from what I've heard, Austin in like the late '90s and early 2000s is a lot like how Portland is today. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. But definitely Austin keeping it weird. I miss I miss all that Austin stuff. How did you get into brewing originally? That is um so i started brewing with a mr beer uh mr beer kit so it was full extract it was the little plastic two gallon mr beer kegs um that are actually shaped like kegs uh so i started doing that and then um i don't know from there i did i brewed like 10 extract batches and then just somehow started doing partial boils maybe like two or three partial boils and then i just jumped up from there and it was just like now nah, like okay i'm gonna do um all, 
all grain, and I've just never looked back um, since doing all grain. Any reason you got uh, into so... or is it just you're gone? Um, yeah, so I'll take yours, Haven, and then I think, Will, you're trying to jump in with a question, too. But, uh, yeah, the reason I got into brewing, you mean, like, started, um, you know, with uh, with um, the Mr. Beers or why I jumped to Blue Owl or both? Uh, why why you started home brewing in general? It was just someone got you a kid as a gift. I know that's kind of a common common thing that happens. Uh, yeah, it was. So, um, my best man for my wedding, Ben Knust, got me, uh, a Mr. Beer kit. Uh, and so, yeah, he, he, like, we had, we'd been sort of exploring, like, craft beers together. Um, we lived in the same town at the time, so we were exploring craft beers and, and drinking a whole bunch of different craft beers. And then, uh, I liked cooking, so I was always cooking, um, and exploring new foods and new flavors. And he realized, he found this kit, I think it was like, I don't know, 30, 50 bucks, something like that from... Uh, like Bed Bath and Beyond or someplace, he found it and uh, was like, "Hey, maybe Cade would like this. He can make his own beer um, since he likes food." So he bought it for me, and I loved it. And I made that first beer, and the first beer was probably not great, but I thought it was amazing. I thought it was the best beer, maybe not the best beer I'd ever tasted, but it was good. And I was so happy that I made it, and I was like, "Oh, this is awesome." The next batch was terrible and tasted like a stinky sock. Uh, which I think I've shared that story on the podcast before, but I they Mr. Beer sells cleanser, but they don't sell sanitizer. So I cleansed the keg, um, and but I did not sanitize the keg. Uh, and so between cleansing and when I put the beer in there, something got in that keg, and it was nasty, like stinky gym socks and grossness. So I threw that out, and I think that's ultimately <laughs> why I started doing like extracts on the on on the uh on the stove and then went to all grain once i was able to get the equipment well I, i'm gonna piggyback oh. on what havo has because i'm curious about this question as well is like what was your um road to getting to your certified cicerone because that's something i'm also interested in and i know you have a cicerone and some uh, bjcp credentials so can you tell us a little bit about the road to get those and what your experience was like yeah, for sure. I think this is uh, timely because I think we just um, w released that episode with Ricky Wells on the Brew Lab. So people were really enjoying that where she was talking about her uh, advanced Cicerone. Um, I'm I'm a certified Cicerone and certified BJCP judge. Um, so yeah, c um, I just was like, I don't know, four or five years ago, I just realized, I just was thinking like, okay, I'm, 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 I've done this lawyer thing. I've had fun, but I want. I think I can do something that I enjoy more, um, and exploring beer. And so I was trying to think about ways, like, okay, how can I make a shift into the brew, the brewing industry? Because who's gonna hire like a lawyer to come and like work in a brewery, right? And you're not gonna hire this guy to go and uh, brew beer or work in a cellar or do anything like that. So I was like trying to figure out what credentials I could do. Um, and I came upon the certified Cicerone and I was like, oh man, this sounds great because I like food and beer, like I mentioned. Um, and that's a big part of preparing for the certified Cicerone exam. Um, so that's what I started to do. I took the certified beer server. I, I was also doing BJCP certification at the time. So that made like the certified beer server part easier and also the tasting for the certified Cicerone uh, easier because I was trying to do them both. Uh, at the same time. So I studied a little bit for the certified beer server and took the online test, got that pretty quickly. Uh, and then it started, then like the path to Cicerone was just really long um, and difficult. I, I mean, I, I, I took the exam one time and passed it, which is great because there's not, that's a, there's a lot of people that don't pass it the first time. Um, so I got lucky in that regard. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just drinking a lot of beer studying and memorizing the BJCP guidelines. Uh, and then, you know, uh, like going from there, it's like um, tasting beers, trying to learn the differences between the style. I mean, I think Haven mentioned earlier, Ordinary Bitter is the average brews, uh, you know, brew for this next round. So Ordinary Bitter, what's the difference between an Ordinary Bitter and an Extra Special Bitter, right? And can you taste the difference? Um, if you're served those two beers or how does an ordinary bitter compare to, I don't know, a Belgian gold golden or a, or a Trappist single or something, right? Like what are the differences there? So you just start to look at that. Um, but yeah, it was just a lot of studying, a lot of reading. I read a bunch of books. I read tasting beer by Randy Mosier, read the brewmaster's table by Garrett Oliver, 
um, read How to Brew with John Palmer. Um, I mean, I'd already read that. I've read that book a couple times. Um, what, what else did I read? Oh, man. If I had my – oh, let's look over here at my brewing shelf and see. Oh, I read uh, The New IPA with Scott Janish. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bunch of, just a bunch of other books um, that I – anything that I could get my hands on. And so that's what I did, trying to study for the Certified Cicerone, which was cool and uh, a lot of fun. I mean, tasting beers is probably the biggest thing because you just have to have that. Then, like, that's a huge part of your uh, score for the Cicerone exam. So off-flavor tasting, trying different beers. I think there was one time I had like seven different bottles of German pills in front of me <laughs> at one time, um, which was a lot of fun. But yeah, it's pretty fun. And, and it's fun to just drink through all that much beer and, and learn and expand your horizons. I'm actually drinking a, um, a Pelican Wing Wave, which is a dry hopped lager right now. Uh, so not a style necessarily, but a tweener category. Anyway. Yeah, that's a cool question. Thanks for asking about the Cicerone stuff. No, that's definitely something I've been interested in, so I really appreciate you uh, going down that rabbit hole a little bit. Um, Will Allwart, the winner of the, the Brew Club uh, experiment series, had a couple of questions online since he can't be here, but uh, really hard hitters like, what Mexican food dish do you miss the most? <laughs> oh man, you know that's so funny because you and I were talking about that earlier today. Will you, you had lunch at Chewy's today and were teasing me about that? Um, hey, I didn't yeah, do any food. I just had the Dosarita. That's all I had. <laughs> the Dosarita is great too. I love that, or the Corona Rita as well. Uh, I love those two, and I do miss Chewy's. Um, man, I mean, Mexican food up here is just not as good as it was in Texas, or at least it's just different, right? Maybe it's just totally different, like. Uh, I, uh, but, but man, I really miss it. Um, the, the dish, oh, the dishes I miss the most breakfast tacos. That's what I miss the most. There are no, I've not found a breakfast taco within a 30 mile radius of my house. Um, and that's like, that's unheard of in Austin. You should be able to walk to a place and get breakfast tacos from anywhere, right? <laughs> At any time of the day, you should be able to get a breakfast taco. Uh, so that one I miss the most. Uh, the bean cheese and chor chorizo breakfast taco, and then uh, a potato uh, egg and uh, 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 what's the uh, what's it? Oh, bacon, potato egg and bacon. That's my other one. <laughs> Those are the ones I miss the most. So, so it's funny you mentioned the bean and cheese because I have a friend from that was from Wisconsin that moved to San Antonio, and uh, somebody offered her a bean and cheese taco for breakfast. She's like, "What? Okay, sure," and then. Like she's back in Wisconsin, she craves bean and cheese tacos for breakfast now because they're just so stupid good here. Um, <laughs> um and, and then unless somebody else has got something else pressing, what he will also ask, what regional northwestern food dish do you currently like the most? Ooh, regional northwestern food dish that I like the most. You know, so that's an interesting one. I haven't tried a whole lot of like regional northwest cuisine. Um Let's see. I know everybody's going to say, like, Dungeness Crab. That's what I need to have tried. And I just haven't had it yet. Um, oh, there's, like, Rockfish. Rockfish is a good one that's up here. There's uh, Pacific Rockfish. That's, like, a, one of the – I think one of the types of fish that they pick up up here. But a Pacific Rockfish um, just, like, sautéed with some, like, seasonings on it. Um, that one's been really good, too. Pacific Rockfish, I guess, would be my, my favorite one so far. I gotta, I gotta get like more involved in the, in the like Northwest food culture. I just haven't done it yet. I got the IPAs thing down because you can't go anywhere without finding an IPA or eight IPAs. So, um, so, so you, you get rockfish. Y'all have halibut and and y'all should have some salmon up there as well, right? Yeah, yeah, salmon up here too. Yeah, the salmon actually swim, uh, actually spawn up here too. So it's kind of fun. I, we haven't gone to watch it, but apparently it's a thing you can do. And then he has something about fry sauce, and I don't even know what fry sauce is. So maybe you can elaborate whether or not you like it and what it is. Okay, I, I don't know about fry sauce. I mean, I know fry sauce because it's an option up here. So that was a weird thing that whenever I first – there's two weird things. When you order french fries, they come with a choice of ketchup or ranch, right? And I love ranch and french fries. I always did that in Texas, but I was the oddball in Texas that was dipping my french fries in ranch. It's like a staple up here. People love dipping their French fries in ranch up here, which is great because I love it. Um, but their ketchup 
has her like it's got harissa in it which is this like weird spice like earthy spice so their ketchup's not like it's not like heinz 57 or like whatever the grocery store brand ketchup it's got like this additional spice in it and everybody loves that stuff i don't like it at least not yet i haven't developed an appreciation for it yet i just want regular <laughs> ketchup with my fries or actually what just skip the ketchup i'll take the ranch <laughs> that's awesome yeah <laughs> um so um i've listened a little bit on your sensory panel episode but but the last episode of the brew lab that i really really loved was the one with uh blue owl and, mm. and i know you had some personal connections there um and and there were some things in that podcast i didn't know like i didn't know that they went from wild cultures because that was something that was news to me i figured they probably store bought their cultures um so that's really fascinating but but can you go when they say mash sour can you elaborate I don't expect you to give away trade secrets from Blue Owl, but can you kind of elaborate on generalities of what that process looks like and, and how they arrive to what they get to? Because um, I know I've sent Haven some Blue Owl. I don't know that probably Havo may have had it because he lives in Austin or at least live in Austin. Um, but for sour beers, they are super amazing uh, and quite approachable, even if you're not into sour. So if you could go into that, that'd be awesome for me. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Blue Owl's an amazing sour brewery. So if you get, if you get the chance to go to Texas – um, definitely, definitely check out Blue Owl because it's great. Um, they, and so what they do and the thing that I love about them is they are using a wild culture, but on the front end. So before the boil, all right, uh, they're not using a wild culture like at the back end. So like after fermentation or like going into a barrel or something. So like a great example is like Sapwood Cellars. If you go to Sapwood Cellars, which Mike, Michael Tonsmeyer and Scott Janish's um, a brewery in DC. Uh, Michael Tonsmeyer does American sour and he does it in barrels that are aged for a long time, right? So, I mean, these beers that you're getting from him are going to have sat for six months, eight months, nine months, a year, two years, five years, whatever. Uh, you know, so that's a very different type of souring process. What Jeff does is it's really cool and he's actually got a totally custom brew house. So, even you, so, you know, I think he even mentioned on the show. That, that you know there's no way to give away the trade secrets because he has a custom brew house <laughs> um, so it's like it'd be hard, hard to replicate but what you can do and way the way to think about it is kettle sour right so so he uses the term sour mash because that's what they like to use for for uh, uh blue owl but it's really just a kettle sour so the whole idea is you mash your wort and then you draw the uh, uh the liquor off so uh, hot, uh, so louder the liquor off into a different vessel and then you pitch some sort of inoculum, right? Some sort of bacteria culture, which is like Lactobacillus or Britannomyces or Acetobacter or some whatever, you know, mix of cultures or multiple of each of those or and, and even Saccharomyces or whatever. Um, but you just throw those um, into the, the kettle mash uh, and then let it sit like overnight at like 110 Fahrenheit, I think is what he was talking about. Um, so sorry, Jordan or Brian down in Australia. I don't have the Celsius offhand. Um, but somewhere around that, uh, you know, 110 Fahrenheit, let it sit overnight and it sours. And then the next day you boil. So the, what that does, it kills off all those microorganisms. So you don't have to worry about contaminating anything downstream. So when you rack over into your fermenter, you've got perfectly sterilized wort, just like everybody else has. Then you pitch your yeast in and the yeast does all of the fermentation. So you're just going to see a small drop, like maybe a tenth of percent or maybe two tenths of a percent of ABV. Uh, in terms of your alcohol, because that's really all the lactic acid with bacteria and acetobacter need uh, in order to to do it. So, uh, so yeah, it's it's a pretty cool process, and that's what a lot of people do. So, if like you're a home brewer, for example, uh, you just go straight in. You've you've got your wort. You you can if you're brewing the bag, just pull the bag out, and then you've got your wort right there. Pitch it with something um, like uh, uh, you know uh, what's that experiment I just did? Uh, it's like W25. Is that lactobacillus? Uh, from Imperial. Yeah. So you can pitch it with something like that, Lactobacillus brevis, pitch that in, let it sit overnight. You want to do a temperature much lower than 110 for Lacto brevis because it does it's not happy above like 95 Fahrenheit. Um, so, you know, do you pitch that overnight, let it sit, and then you've got a sour beer. But it's the great thing about it is, is it doesn't have any of that funky Brett or barnyard. Um, and for the most part, it won't have any like acetobacter or vinegar or anything in it. It's just sour, which is awesome. Um, and that's what I love because it's just like – like I mentioned on the podcast, it's like adding lemon juice to salmon. It just adds that little punch of tartness that just brings the flavor of everything up a little bit, uh, which is – or if you add lemon to rockfish. So 
Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's kind of how Blue Owl does it. And that's one of the reasons why I've started doing that. That's how I make sour beers these days. If I'm going to make a sour, um, I do it doing that. But yeah. Um, and somebody asked about their favorite beers. Alex asked, does anyone here have a favorite beer from Blue Owl? And I have a favorite beer from Blue Owl. I love all their beers. Their core three are Little Boss, Spirit Animal, uh, and Van Damme. Oh, if, and Cool in the Gang, too. Don't forget that one. That was they, they were core three when I was there. They are now core four. Um, so Cool in the Gang is the one we talked about on the podcast, which is the English bitter. It's the ordinary bitter with black tea. Um, sour, ordinary bitter with black tea. But it's like 3.5%, so it's crushable. Like, Will, when it's 105 tomorrow in San Antonio, um, you can crush that beer and, and stay hydrated. Uh, <laughs> and it tastes just like tea, so you're going to love it being from Texas. Um, and so the other three spirit animals is, is a pale ale sour little boss is a wheat sour and Van Dam is kind of like an amber ale, uh, like a sour amber ale. So I got some caramel character in there, but my favorite beer that they make is a beer called Tiki hop totem and Tiki hop totem, uh, is a milkshake IPA with pineapple and coconut. And anybody that says that that beer is not good can fight me. Dude, I, I saw that on the store shelf the other day, and it said milkshake, and I just walked past. As soon as I see milkshake, that's like an immediate turnoff for me. I just leave it alone. Um, I, I've, I know. I've had Spirit Animal and Van Damme. They're my go-to camping beers. Like, I love taking those beers camping. Yeah. Uh, but they had a uh, – oh, crap. I can't remember the name of it. It was in a Pepto pink can, and it was like – it was kind of like a brute beer because it was really finished really dry. And yeah. had a whole bunch of like mango and tropical fruit flavors to it. And tropical even brute. Wife, yeah. Yeah. Tropical brute. Tropical brute. Yeah. And that beer is amazing. That might be my favorite blue owl, even though they're all good that I've had, but that might be yeah. my favorite blue owl. Tropical before. brute is really good too. It's like tropical fruit. It that one was intended to be like um like a really minerally like like um hop water kind of like a almost, right? But it's like very light, but it's got all this tropical flavor, uh, which is awesome. And then uh somebody oh yeah, uh, Haven. I think mentioned Dapper Devil. Was that you, Haven? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he mentioned oh, yeah. Dapper Devil. That was a fun one. I have a fun story about Dapper Devil. So um, one of the things that the canning line people do uh, once we can a new round of a beer um, is at the end of the canning run, you shotgun from the first batch, right? So when Dapper oh. Devil comes out, we're going to make like six or seven batches. But the first batch, when you can that, um, when you're done, everybody shotguns it. Well, Dapper Devil comes in a 16-ounce can, and it's like 8%, okay? <laughs> So everybody's ready to shotgun, but I was studying. I had chemistry class that evening, right? So it was like I'm about to leave the brewery and go, like, learn chemistry, like general – like organic chem. It was actually, like, organic chemistry. So I was going to go, and I'm like, hey, you know what? Let's do it. Whatever. So I shotgunned a whole can of Dapper Devil and then went, like, totally buzzed uh, to, to, uh, the, to organic chemistry, which was fun. That that sounds exciting. Uh, that sounds really <laughs> exciting. No, um, I I have to say like anyone that can get a hold of Blue, Blue Owl, I've just everything that I thought was disgusting, like or would be weird, like it just turns out good somehow. Like they they pretty well know what they're doing. Um, again, that tropical brute my wife described as like the perfect brunch beer because it tastes almost like a mimosa because it finishes so dry with that champagne flavor. So yeah, it's so um, good. And, and even if you don't like sour beers, they've got um they've got uh what is it Bob's Fine Pills so Blue Owl Brewing B O B Bob's Fine Pills and they've got a couple of IPAs now too that aren't sour. Mm, I may have to make a run by there after I go to Live Oak here in a few weeks. So uh, oh, that's another brewery I missed. That's a great one. German beers, but great. Uh, they, they've got some cool stuff going on at Live Oak, and that's that's all I have to say about that for the moment. Um. So Craig Graham on Facebook, he, he, I don't think he's able to make it. I don't see him on here, but he asked a question. Thank you, sir. Um, but he asked, are there any exper experiments that you would like to do but for whatever reason can't get done, um, whether it's just like because they're not restricted to one variable or there's some other restrictions? I don't know how much you want to get into restrictions you are as a philosopher or not, but like are there some cool experiments you wish you could get done? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, that's going to take a minute to think about because there are a lot of them that I want to get done. Like, And especially um, one of the things we're, we're hopefully going to start doing here pretty soon is stacked variables. So stuff that we've shown wasn't significant if it's an individual single variable. We may combine two insignificant variables and see if that changes things. Um, so an example might be something like 
mash length versus uh, or like you know so we did 60 minutes versus 30 minutes but what about like a mash length of 60 minutes and a boil length of 30 minutes right so or, or versus like a mash length of 30 minutes and a boil length of 60 minutes or something like that right so there's two stack variables because you're changing the mash and you're changing the boil temperature so that one is going to be i think that would be a lot of fun um there's a bunch of them that i think would be cool to see like done uh like like where there's where there's a uh, yeah with stacked variables or because of restrictions or something like there's um man i wish i could think i wish i could have had some off the of mind all right maybe let's ask another question i'll keep thinking about this one and i'll see if i can answer it in a in a minute okay um and then matthew hay asked uh can you do more experiments with imperial stouts because apparently he's the imperial stout guy <laughs> i'm not I'm fine with Imperial Stouts, but man, I can't drink 10 gallons of Imperial Stout. I just can't do it. <laughs> so, I mean, that's fine. Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, Matt, if you want to pitch something, um, shoot me an email and I'll see. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I mean, if he's going to listen to this, <laughs> since he's not on. But but yeah, if you're going to listen to this, Matt, shoot me an email and I'll try to do an Imperial Stout experiment just for you. Well, and part of the thing with Imperial Stout is they require some age. So it's not just like a quick turn and burn experiment. Like you actually have to like plan it out and it's not going to happen this month. It's going to be a few months before your Imperial Stout data gets collected. So I can see that being a little bit prohibitive. Yeah, yeah. Cool. What other questions do we have over in the chat? Or I can make something up. Um, Sure, Sean. Of all the different experiments you have taken part in, which experiment results surprised you the most? And I'm going to add a caveat, other than water. <laughs> other than water. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that sucks because that's my go-to answer <laughs> is water. <laughs> um, I did the same crap to Marshall if it feels, makes you feel any better. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, all right. So setting aside water, what's been my most uh, – which of all the different – oh, yeah. All right. Which one surprised me the most? I got a good one here. And this is one that I did. It was extract versus all grain. That one shocked me because I, I thought I was always one of those brewers. Remember, I started with extract, so I was always one of those brewers that was like, no, extract tastes the same as all grain. doesn't matter. There's no difference, right? Like there is absolutely no difference. If you brew an extract batch and an all grain batch, it's going to taste the same. There's just – there you can make great beer with both, both but one step further, it's going to taste the same. So we put that to the test. We got an extract kit um, from More Beer. So More Beer sells all of their recipe – well, not all of them, but most of their recipe kits in either an extract or an all-grain version. So we got – like, and, and they're intended. Like they're made to taste the same, right? So we went and got uh, – uh, well, or, or More Beer donated it to us. But we got um, a, a – uh, was, was it a porter? Oh, I can't remember the recipe, but I have to go back and look. But anyway, we got an extract version and an all grain version. And by the way, brewing an extract version is so freaking easy these days. I would like I really miss brewing extract because it's just dumping it in, boil it for ten or fifteen minutes or however long to isomerize your hops, and then you're done. Like talk about short and shoddy. That's like the easiest brew day ever if it's all extract with no no steeping grains. Um, but anyway, so we did that. Uh, did so extract versus all grain. Tested it, um, and I was it was me, so it was during COVID, so it was just me that wasn't served to tasters, although it was there is another uh, uh, brewlogic experiment where we did that. But uh, t I think it was like nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 absolutely tasted a difference. Like there was there was a difference between extract and all grain. And that one to me was like super shocking. Yeah, Alex just linked it in, uh, in the chat. So it was an American stout. Hey, um, there we go. That's that's what. Uh, not an imperial stout, but it was an American stout. Uh, but in any event, uh, we – so I, I tasted a difference, and I absolutely noticed a difference. Like, there was no question in my mind um, it was different. Uh, and, and and I liked the all-grain batch just slightly better because it just had, like, a little bit more full character, a little bit more, like, rounded, but just slightly. Both of those beers were fantastic, um, which is great. And so I've now tweaked my message with regard to – you know uh the 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 extract versus all grain beers so extract and all grain both make fantastic great beers but they don't make the same beer um and so i think that's i i think it's just because of the way that extract is processed and it's hard to like get the exact same grain ratios um in extract the, the most of the extract companies don't tell you exactly what grains are going into that so yeah 
that's a uh, that's I think the most um, the most the most impactful one to me, other than the water ones. Which again, I'll caveat and I'll 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 buckle against Will here a little bit. The water ones always um, surprise me, and I'm I'm starting to think like, oh man, water. We need to pay way more attention to the water that we're brewing with, rather than just like ah, if it tastes good, you can make good beer. I wonder if those are connected too, since you don't know what kind of water they use when they make extract. That's right. Alex, were you the one that made that comment? Somebody made a comment about that. Um, it might've been you, <laughs> uh, but, but somebody made a comment about that on the, on, um, on the, the article. And we talked about it in the podcast episode. I thought that was a fantastic comment too, right? Cause it absolutely could make a difference depending on how that wort was made, um, versus like the water that was used for the all grain batch. Cause you just don't know, right? You don't know, um, the water chemistry there. Absolutely. I love how Palmer phrases it where he's like, I've had good beers made from extract and bad beers made from all grain. Like it's not whether you can produce good or bad beer from either one. It's just different. Yeah. Gotta, I love the way that John phrases things. He's like, so, so good about that. That's exactly right. Like that's totally what I, what, how I agree. I've had bad beers that are all grain. I've had great beers that are extract and I like them. I like them both. If you serve me a beer and it tastes good, I don't care how you brewed it. I'm just glad that it was great. I, well, I may care so that I can emulate it, but I'm not exactly. like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I have, uh, experienced some bad extract. Like, um, I had somebody give me a, an extract kit that was about six months past the expiration date. <laughs> and this pale extract was now black. And you're <laughs> like, Oh, this is an Imperial stout now that tastes like funky. Uh, so, so I do think with LME, there is some oxidation that happens. And so fresh is always best, but that's, mm -hmm. that can be same. You same know, uh, if you, if you do have an old extract kit, you might consider using it as a starter. Um, some of that, just like keep that around. Cause the sugars hadn't go anywhere. It's just all the other flavor molecules too. So if you're just harvesting the yeast out of the starter, don't pitch the actual liquid, um, into your, into your fermenter. But if you're just pitch if you're just pulling the yeast out, like just a little bit of yeast out of that starter, you be, should be totally fine. Cool. Well, there's a couple of questions in the chat, and I'm going to kind of pair these together, even though they're about mi a mile apart. But uh, one is, what is the batch size of beer you make now at home? Do you see home brewers getting into bigger and smaller batches? And then the next question is, is like, do you what what kind of brewing system are you using right now? An electric, gas, brewing a bag, and those kind of relate. So, yeah. Um. So yeah, the current batch size that I brew. Let's see. When did I become a Brewlosophy contributor? I was either 2018 or 2019. Uh, since then, I've never brewed a beer that wasn't for an experiment. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, I, well, I, I say that I haven't. I I haven't done maybe one or two batches that weren't for an experiment. So, um, pretty much any time I'm brewing these days, it's always for an experiment. So that's a 10 gallon batch. Um, but usually split either. It's usually a full 10 gallon batch all at once. Or it's split more often. It's split into two five-gallon batches. So when I first started at Brewlosophy, I had an SS Brewtech uh, gas propane system, uh, and that was what I primarily brewed on. And so I had that big twenty-gallon, uh, two twenty-gallon mash tuns, a big fifteen-gallon kettle. Um, and so I was doing all all of the experiments that I did at the very beginning were um, just post I'm sorry post boil. So I could split into fermenters and do all that stuff, but it was just post-boil uh, experiments. So that's what I started with. Uh, since then, I'm now brewing on the electrics, and I like the electric way better just because of the footprint. Like, it's just so easy. I can leave the stuff set up all the time, um, just, like, right where it is on my – and I can brew inside without too much issue um, from, from, you know, uh, heat and, and condensation and stuff. But with a window open it's and a fan going, I don't really have any issues. Uh, brewing inside and that's one thing i really like uh the other thing too is just the convenience of electricity the electricity doesn't ever go out or rarely does unlike propane i mean i've i've emptied a tank of propane in the middle of a brew day before and that sucks um the other thing about the electric is the pumps like the recirculating pump so easy to maintain mash temperature um you know uh, getting up to boils challenging depending on your power supply if you're brewing 240 Getting up to a boil is going to take no time at all. But if you're brewing on 110 volt systems, you got to be ready for like a hour long rise uh, up to temperature. Even with extra burners and stuff, it just it hasn't worked out for me. 
Uh, but that's what I'm currently brewing on. So I've got the Unibrow uh, 110 volt system. So it plugs into my power right here at the house. I didn't have to put in any 240 or anything like that. No changes to the electricity. It just plugs into a regular outlet here in the US. Um, and yeah, it comes with a recirculating pump. It's brew in the bag, so or brew in a in a bucket, I guess, uh, or in a mesh strainer. So you just pull the strainer out and let it sit. Everything drains out, raise it to boil, um, and go that way. So it's super easy, and I really really enjoy that. So that's what I that's what I do now. Yeah, and and uh, batch size is pretty much exclusively ten gallons. Although those um, brow supply one ten volts are uh, five gallon batch size, and really. I say it's it, there should also be a caveat too. It's five gallon and pretty much no higher than 1065 OG, because um, you just can't fit the amount of grain into the batch without doing some sort of reiterative mash. Which oh, that's an experiment we need to do again too. That's one I'd love to see stacked as well. Um, a re some reiterative mash experiments in some different styles. So, um, so, so one thing that, uh, I personally do when I brew stuff like triples or quads or whatever is, um, I skip three day mash and I do, I do a partial mash where I had like three pounds of DME or something just to offset the gravity mm. because, mm -hmm. because at mm -hmm. some point, um, at least when I've done reiterated mashing, I've always missed my gravity and had to add DME anyways. So mm -hmm. why not <laughs> just skip that step and yeah. go straight to the end and save a couple hours? Yeah, no, that's a good idea, and I should I should think about doing that. One thing also to be careful with with the electric systems, if that lick if that liquid um, malt extract hits your burner, um, you're gonna flash it. It's gonna it's gonna flash on your on your um, element, your heating element. So be careful of that. But otherwise, yeah, that's a great idea, and maybe that's how I should start doing it. And also, Tristan, I, I saw that you you uh, you said in there that it's in. Oh no, Ben said it's induction capable. I'd be interested in learning about this. I don't know. Um, how you did that, but let's chat offline about how that, or you chat now about how that works. Cause that'd be interesting. I don't no, know. I, we I can think, chat I later. Think, I think it'd be cool to do a, uh, maybe a, just a normal beer versus a partial mash beer. Um, I know, I know you did extract versus all grain, but maybe like a, a normal beer that's, you know, all grain. And then just like a, you know, a pound of DME to see if like a pound of DME, me throws it off that much because i know there's some water chemistry stuff oh yeah, yeah. reiterative of a reiterative mash versus a dme edition yeah that could yeah, yeah that'd be yeah. really cool just to see what that would do but that's just mm -hmm. that's just me um yeah brian had a cool comment about australia that uh, everyone's pretty much doing all-in-one electric but uh, they also have 240 so that yeah. makes a lot more sense 220 yeah yeah that makes a lot more sense and it makes it a lot more e a lot easier i mean again with that power you can raise to a boil in 10 to 15 minutes using 240 volt systems that's what marshall brews on and i'm gonna get to it someday i just got to convince the wife that we need to hire an electrician to run some <laughs> some new wiring so so based off of that how long is your brew day uh i can get it all done in about four and a half or five hours so right about five hours and that's set up to clean up right so that's like all of it. So setting up the equipment. Well, although the equipment's usually set up, so don't really, you know, count that too much. It's from the start of the brew day, putting the water in. That's at like 120 out of the faucet, you know. So I brew with tap water, so it's at like 120. Raise it up to whatever mash temperature. Mash 45 minutes to raise from mash temperature to boil. Boil for an hour. It's and then clean up. So right around four and a half to five hours. That, that's. Yeah, my, I, if I do water the night before and I get it heated to where all I do is wake up and, and pour milled grain in, I'm around three and a half, four hours. Yeah, that's something I wish I could do. I really do. I wish I could plan that far in advance. I'm just shitty about at it. Like I, as many times as I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you know, get your water. And like, it's, it's always like the night before too. I'm always like, oh, I'm brewing tomorrow. I'm going to go down there and get my water and, and mill my grains. And I never do. <laughs> oh, that's awesome yeah it's always just wake up in the morning but i do like to brew early in the morning so i usually get started brewing at like 6 a.m or maybe like maybe even like 5 30 so i'm done by like 11 uh yeah i, I would agree with that that's especially with kids mm -hmm. uh, that makes a big difference um yep. so what's your brewing life been like since kids came into your life <laughs> well, uh, since the second kid it's been harder <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, brewing life is tough. 
And again, that's why I do it early in the morning. So it's kind of like just like finding times that like don't impact the family as much. So if I can brew from like, you know, 545 or like six o'clock to, you know, 11 or 1130 on a Saturday morning. I mean, nobody's doing anything before 11 o'clock on Saturday anyway, um, at least right now. So, yeah, it's just been kind of that. But, yeah, I mean, it's fun, too, though. The cool part is like your 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 kid, like my oldest is three and a half, almost four now. So he's able to, like, help me measure out the grains and like loves putting the equipment together. So he'll hand me like the little tri clamp fittings and I'll be like, OK, I need a clamp and a fitting. And he'll come right behind me and, and help me uh, install them, which is awesome. My kid's favorite thing to do is like measure grain and measure hops because then they can look at the little scale and look at how the numbers are kind of different. And like mm-hmm. my, my daughter, she she um she'll treat my water for me. Like she'll measure out all the calcium. Oh wow, nice. Some, like, she'll totally treat my water for me. I gotta kind of look over my shoulder and I make sure to when she measures, I pour it in a different bowl just so that we don't contaminate because I don't trust her enough to like do it all at once. But she'll, <laughs> she'll totally treat my water for me nice so cool deal man uh what else we got for Cade oh Haven asked a question about um how did I originally get involved with the the brew club um and how did it lead to becoming a brewlosophy contributor so yeah that's a great question Haven um and uh so I got involved uh with the brew club by just volunteering to brew experiments right to to do brew club experiments um, and it's really cool, too, because it's, like, super flexible. You talked about, like, restrictions earlier. Like, one of the things that we are really restrictive about is, like, making sure that all the equipment is the same. So, again, I have two um, a five-gallon Unibrowse 110 volt systems, and they just sit side by side. I have exactly identical uh, brew bucket fermenters. Um, you know, I've got uh, parallel manifolds for CO2. Uh, the taps are exactly the same. The beer line is exactly the same. I mean, everything like down to like the nuts and bolts and fittings are all the same uh, between those two. So that's like super restrictive. But the awesome part about the brew club is you don't have to be that restrictive, right? Like you, if you want to brew a beer, um, you know, and, and then brew uh, the other beer, like, you know, later that day, that's probably okay. <laughs> you know, so it's just, you know, reach out to the, to the guys here, to the leadership team and talk to him about it. But that's how I got started. I just thought like, hey, I want to try some experiments and see uh, how this works. I was uh, pretty active in the Austin Zealots at the time, uh, which was cool. So I would just take my beers to the homebrew meetings and I just sort of like set up in the corner while everybody else was just kind of standing around drinking beer um, and do an experiment that way. But yeah, I did a couple of experiments. Um, and then I actually met Marshall face to face in Asheville. So we did a BYO uh, boot camp in Asheville. He was speaking with Denny Kahn and Drew Beecham about conducting experiments. Um, and I was just up there attending the camp. So I was, I reached out to Marshall and I said, Hey, I'm a brew club member. Let's, uh, let's have beers. And Marshall was like, Oh hell yeah. Like he always is, um, you know? Uh, so we had a beer and, uh, the rest, you know, kind of was history and I just became a brew, brew, brew club or brew, brew philosophy contributor. Um, I, again, I already had at that time, I already had a big 10 gallon system. Um, so I was already able to brew full size 10 gallon batches and then split into two fermenters. And then I got the, uh, electric system later. Uh, but yeah, that's how I got started, uh, in the brew club. And then that just led to the brewlosophy, uh, to being a brewlosophy contributor. And then the brew lab set up, um, I think maybe you guys have heard before too, but it was just kind of, I real I was moving up to Oregon state and about to do this like academic side, like the actual professional research side of brewing. And I just thought, hey, I'm going to be reading all these papers and doing all this stuff. It'd be really cool to interview brewing scientists. So I started talking to Marshall about that, and then the brew lab was born. Okay, um, past or present, uh, Marshall will never actually take time to watch this, so talk about whatever trash you want. Coolest brewlosophy contributor, past or present? <laughs> cool, uh, coolest brewlosophy contributor, past and present. You're I like love Kate the brew. Joe, group. mother effers. No, no, I like I I love them all. Uh, what about future members? Oh, hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I don't know. Um, yeah, no, I don't have a, I don't have a favorite. I love them all. I love those guys. I mean, it. The, so that's one of the cool parts too. Is we we we're pretty close. Um, we always run everything by each other. So we're talking all the time, right, about different experiments. It's like, hey, somebody pitches a, a experiment, like I was talking earlier about, like, mash length and boil length. Somebody pitches it, and there's 15 emails about it, right? Or, or like, a chat, 
you know, we talk about regular life. Like, like we talk about, you know, breakfast tacos. We talk about all kinds of things. So I feel like I know these guys like so well. Um, and that's pretty awesome. I mean, if any of them were coming anywhere close to Corvallis, I'd go out of my way to meet them. So it's pretty cool. I, I, I like all the brew crew, brew crew, even the, the past, uh, at present and hopefully the future ones too. I think Haven always called Brian the handsomest. <laughs> I'm not. I, I swear you called him the Excuse handsomest. Excuse me, I said that. Oh, was Alex, Alex explained that one. Oh, sorry, misattributed. <laughs> yeah. Brian was the He's handsomest. He's got that rugged Alaskan look. Mm, oh, you got you got a thing for moose men huh? or, or lumberjacks. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I I do kind of miss Malcolm trolling Marshall every podcast. Like that was. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was so fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was that was good. Yeah, I do kind of miss those guys. I mean, I miss I overlapped a little bit with Brian and and Malcolm, not so much, but uh, but I did I do know him and chat with him regularly. Yeah, no, it's fun. We have a lot of fun, and and like we said, we always talk about it. It's like it's a really collegial, you know, pitch your idea, and it doesn't matter what it is, right? Like there's there's no negative feedback. We're just talking about it, trying to make uh do the best experiments that we can. So yeah, I love those guys. I mean, they're all they're all great. Have you met any of them in person? Other than Marshall? Um, uh, other than Marshall? No. I have oh, not. Wow. Not yet. Uh, not yet. I say that. But I remember, I started in what? Maybe, I think it was 2019 that I started. So then 2020 was just, you know, yeah, shit show. Yeah. Uh, and then 2020 continued, or 2021 continued. <laughs> and now here we are in 2022. So, yeah. So, no, I haven't met him yet. Go. Although, um, I want to go to, I didn't make it to HomebrewCon uh, this year. I'm going to try to make it next year in San Diego. And maybe since it's close to Marshall and Andy, at least we'll get to see those guys. But um, Is any, anybody talking about hop harvest in this year, next year? Uh, yeah, there's been talk about it. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, uh, but there has been talk about it. Hop harvest would be a great way uh, to get to meet everybody. Especially, I mean, I'm going to be physically participating in hop harvest <laughs> for, for some of the uh, experiments that we're doing in Dr. Shellhammer's lab. But yeah, that'd be badass. I'd love to get together for that. Ooh, that's a really good question. And then I'll switch over to some of Havo and Scott's. But um, I, I know Brilosophy gets contributed as being kind of garage science, which I think is a fair description. Um, can you can you explain like why uh, lab science, Brilosophy science, or maybe some of the differences, and why it might be incredibly boring for a website to do lab experiments all the time? <laughs> Uh, 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 yeah, all right. man that's a good question all right um and and uh so first of all um brewlosophy as garage science i'm okay with that that moniker i don't mind i've said it myself a bunch of times uh but if you look at the volume of work uh the volume of experiment articles and everything that brewlosophy is putting out and the rigor right the statistical rigor and like making sure that everything is is um exactly the same that there's no differences or no no variables that everything's laser focused on single on single variables. Um, I, I I go a step further, and I think this is this is also because of the brew lab and uh, talking with people. Um, I'm not touting brewlosophy's horn, although I will a little bit. I can't tell you the number of people that I've talked to in the industry that are like, "Oh, cool, you work with brewlosophy, man. You guys do great work." These are brewers. These are actually they're not even brewers. Some some of them are brewers. But also some of them are analytical chemists, right? Like working in quality control labs at the brewers. I mean, that's real scientists, right? Working in quality control labs. And they're talking about brewlosophy. I mean, they're like, oh, yeah, I read that article. What do you think about blah, blah, blah? Or, oh, when I read that, I thought, oh, I need to do this. You know, another thing, too, is I've heard, um, I've heard more than one person, um, I think three, actually, um, say that they, the first place that they look when they have a question about something is to see if Brewlosophy's done an experiment on it. Um, and, and I love that. I mean, that was like, I was like, man, that's awesome to hear uh, that, that people are doing that. So I'll, so I'll push on that a little bit too. Uh, but but the, the, your point about like full, rigorous, academic, peer-reviewed journals, right? And, and so one of, the com one of the consistent feedback that I get from the Brew Lab is it's too information dense. And I get that. And I've tried to do things to make it lighter, but some of these articles are just difficult. Right when they talk about like zoralinone um, as a mycotoxin from brewer spent grains, like those words, people sometimes just go, ah, no, nah, I'm, I'm not interested in chemistry anymore. 
but that's a real thing, right? These things could be poisonous to cows, right? They, they can kill animals um, and they grow in brewer spent grain. So if you've got brewer spent grain that's sitting outside for seven days before the farmer picks it up and then feeds it to his cows and then those cows get fed to a human, that's a problem, right? Um, and so, so yeah, w and, and that's, a, that's a good point. When you're looking at an academic journal, it has a whole bunch of other stuff and it has to be peer reviewed and it has to have multiple people look at it. But also in the academic journals, they're interested in more than just practical result or they're interested in, in, in something else, right? They're interested in showing exactly what all the methods were like we do at philosophy, but they're interested in applying advanced statistics and doing multiple variables, sometimes controlling in different ways so that they can compare and do different things. And also, I mean, they're, they're much more expansive. They're not limited to just a single variable. I mean, you won't see any papers that are published looking at comparing the difference between a match length of 60 and a match length of, Z of 30. No paper is going to do that just by itself. It's going to be a range of different mash links, a range of different beer styles, a range of different stuff. It's going to take them three years to do it. They're not going to be able to do it in a month. Um, and, and then that's when it's going to get published. It's going to take them two years to do the experiment. Then they have to submit it for publication. So even though they did it two years ago, you know, now that now it gets published. That's great. And that's awesome because that's how we improve science, right? This, um, there's an upcoming podcast that I'll go ahead and tease here. Um, which is about a new hop acid that was recently discovered by the by a team at Hop Signer. It's a minor hop acid, so it doesn't impact brewers at all. But for chemists and for people who study this stuff, it, it, it's it, it it it's a new alpha acid. There hasn't been a new alpha acid discovered in almost 20 years. Uh, you know, and and so it's really cool that you like discover a new compound that contributes to beer bitterness. Practical impact, it doesn't matter. It's like less than 0.2% of a uh, total alpha acid contribution. So you're not gonna get any bitterness from it. You're not even gonna be able to taste it, but it's cool that somebody actually detected and identified a new compound in beer in 2022. A beverage that's been brewed for 30, or 2021, actually, I guess is when they detected it. Brew that's been brewed, a beer, a beverage that's been brewed for 3000 years. We're still learning new things about it. And so I think that's something that you can't do at home because that requires analytical techniques. It requires rigorous study and a whole bunch of that stuff. Um, so, you know, I think um, I think the other thing about uh, ac academic science is with brewlosophy, remember, all that we're testing is, is there a difference between two beers, right? Uh, and I like Brian's comment. He says, I always think of it this way. Lab science is measurable difference when the variable is isolated. Brewlosophy is, is there a perceptible difference in an actual beer? Um, so the perceptible difference is the key here to me. It's can you taste the difference between these two beers? An academic paper is going to look at the analytes. So they're going to say the IBUs as measured are this. Those IBUs are different by X number, right? Uh, yeah, and, and thanks, Scott. Quantitative data versus qualitative data. So they're going to have actual analytes that they're going to be measuring, but they're also going to tie it to sensory, or at least most of the good papers. And that's what, uh, you know, one of the things Dr. Shellhammer does is tie everything to sensory. So when we did that paper, or when he did that paper with Scott LaFontaine about, like, uh, you know, the the, uh, the hop saturation point, right? That had both analytical measurements and sensory data. Because then you can look and say like, okay, these compounds are what are changing and causing tropical or herbal or whatever flavor, um, which is cool. And that's something that Brewlosophy can't do. So we can't actually measure the analytical compounds, but we can say tasters did or didn't taste the difference in this beer when it was brewed this way to isolate this variable. So I love that question. Um, and and that, I love talking about that because it's starting to become a, a soapbox for me, especially as I get more and more involved in the industry, I get more and more excited and happy with the product that Brewlosophy's done. <laughs> and Alex says, labs aren't going to brew Imperial Stouts or real beer a lot of the time. <laughs> that's, a, that's another good one. That's true. Yeah, because uh, you're not going to get – you're not going to be able to serve Imperial Stouts to, to tasters a lot, right? Can you imagine, like, getting a tasting panel of, like, 10 beers of all Imperial Stout and be like, here, taste these and tell me what you tell in the 10th beer. <laughs> tell me what you taste and be like, I don't taste anything. I'm numb. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I do love the brew lab, but I do have to admit that uh, it is very polysyllabic, and so I, I have to be in a certain uh, frame of mind, whereas uh, not the brewlosophy is totally monosyllabic, but it's a little bit e easier to, like, 
put in your ear pods and do other stuff and kind of listen along. Whereas like with the brew lab, I have to pay attention. Uh, it's kind of like Jan- Janish's uh, new IPA on audiobook. Like you have to pay attention to that thing. There are lots of big words and big yep. concepts in there that that will go right over your head if you uh, doze off for thirty seconds. So yeah, yeah, and there's and there's a lot. That's a, that's a tough piece too, right? So one of the difficult parts about reading an academic article is it takes a lot of that same brain power, right? But you've got to go find the academic article and then learn about it. So the whole idea for the Brew Lab is is not to shy away from the science, but hopefully to present it in a way that's digestible. It may take you a time or two listening to, but hopefully you take away something. And again, that's one of the reasons why at the end of the show, I try to do like a big key takeaway uh, from the end. But yeah, I mean, I hope, I, I think people are liking it. The reviews are going up. Um, we're still uh, We're still getting traction, so... Um, you know, we'll keep doing it. And I think it's cool too, that it's just getting scientists like into people's ears as well, that there's this other career path in the brewery, which isn't brewing beer as a brewer or like designing recipes. There's a whole bunch of other stuff uh, that you can do as part of working for a brewery. And what's funny too, it reminds me of when we had Chris Kobe on a a brew club meeting and he, uh, he was like, yeah, when it comes to real science, like, if you having to repeat the same thing 10 times over again and duplicate experiments and get all the data, like that doesn't make for good podcast content necessarily or good website yeah. content. And, and as a person, if you're doing it as your hobby, you would get bored of that really quick. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a great point too. Like replicate data. Could you imagine doing 10 reps where you have to go and get like 300 tasters instead of 30 tasters or whatever? I mean, that's just, that, there's no way I couldn't do that as a side gig. I just, I, I couldn't do it. And that's one of the reasons why it takes so long for academic journals to get published, right? Is because they've got to figure out as much, um, as many tasters as they can, as they can get, they've got to do advanced statistics and all kinds of, um, additional analysis. So again, we're sort of laser focused on brewlosophy, but we do deliver a practical, uh, solution, right? These two beers did or didn't taste different when this variable was isolated. Well, man, I want to honor your time. I know you've been on it for an hour. I, I don't know what your time frame is. I don't want to force you to hang out with us any longer than, than you, you have to. But we got a couple more questions and then uh, whatever you need to do for you and your family on a Saturday night. So we appreciate you being here. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, all good. I got, a, I got a little bit more time. I'm happy to hang out. Cool. Um, so Hava asked, what's your favorite hop is using pale ales and or IPAs? Hmm. Favorite hop. This one changes a lot. Um, and so favorite hop currently, let's see, you know, I'm really developing a love of Citra, um, which I did not, uh, love until very recently. It always tasted like cat urine to me, um, and smelled like it. And I did not like Citra, but I'm really starting to develop it. Uh, although I think, I don't know, I don't know if it's my favorite hop. Man, I just keep going back to like my go-tos. Like Tetanang is a go-to hop for me. I never don't have that in stock. I always have Tetanang available. It's like there's there's a couple things that I keep in my house. Like if, if people don't know this about me, but I always have the ingredients to make chocolate chip cookies at all the time, every time, right? So like always, there's never a moment where you can't be like, Cade, make me some chocolate chip cookies. And I'd be like, no, nah, I don't have the ingredients. I do. I have the ingredients and I can make you chocolate chip cookies. Um, I actually just made some last night with my son, which was super fun. Um, but that's like the Tetanang is another one of those hops that I always have. Cascade is another one of those hops that I always have. I never get out of it. In fact, I stopped going to a homebrew store uh, because they didn't have Cascade on the shelves. Um, it's, it's like, nope, you're out. <laughs> I got I to gotta have Cascade. Uh, but favorite hop right now. Oh, you know one that I really want to try is Vista. People have been talking about Vista. This is a new public variety, and people have been, like, raving about it, saying it's, like, the next big aroma hop, like maybe bigger than Citra. Uh, but that one, that one I think could be good. Uh, I-, I love Citra. I think most everybody on here probably loves Citra. Um, Tetanang, Sots, any of those noble hops, great things to have on hand. Amarillo is one that I'm just in love with still. I've been in love with it for years, but I love Amarillo. So, um, but I can't disagree with Citra and I want to try Vista as well. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. So here's Scott has something. If I can get my stuff, stop scrolling. Um, <laughs> and it's a long one. So I may try to paraphrase it badly. Um, so apparently he switched to Bruni bag propane setup and it works well. But one thing he's found is that um, people talk about double crushing your grains to get better efficiency. 
And personally, he only crushes once with his cheap Amazon mill, and he hits his gravity targets. And he's curious about running a comparison. Kind of, if we've done any experiments uh, about single crush versus double crush, uh, producing different gravities and different flavor impacts. Oh, man, that's a good one. I, You know what? That might be my next experiment, assuming that the crew approves it, because um, I've been having struggles with my efficiencies lately. Um, and so, yeah, I want I'm, that may be one that I want to do, like try a single mill versus double mill. Again, I think the issue – I think a thing there too is you could just adjust your mill gap, right? Like just just grind a finer grist, um, and then you don't have to worry about double milling. But I do understand people do that a lot, especially at like homebrew uh, shops that where you can't control the, the grist level. I understand a lot of people are doing that where they mill it, and then they mill it again um, to go through. So, yeah, I mean maybe that would be something that would be interesting uh, for the brew crew. I might pitch that and see what they think. But, yeah, cool idea. Um, and efficiency is one of those things that I, I don't care about anymore just because it's like, I don't, it, like the, the couple bucks of, of grains doesn't bother me. Um, but I do, it does bother me when I don't hit my OG, right? So if I can't predict my system, that's where I have a problem. So, um, early in the year, we talked to Vinny Chalerzo, who's way smarter than probably any of us, mm -hmm. um, um, but but he was saying that like grain quality has gone down over the last couple of years, oh. um, as far as like extraction and stuff like that. So I didn't know if you if you heard anything about that, or if you think like extraction rates due to like poor uh, barley harvest might be contributing to some of our. Because I've had similar efficiency woes, and I've wondered if it was my gear or if it was some other external factor like uh, grain quality or you know just barley harvest quality. Yeah, you know, and that's interesting, too, because I don't know what malts um, Vinny's using. He's probably using quite a few. Um, you know, it's always – I mean, there's always sort of the knee-jerk reaction from the brewer, too. It's like, okay, it's, I'm not getting my efficiency, so blame the, the supplier. Um, but Vinny knows his stuff, right? So that's definitely not him. I mean, he's, he's like, making immaculate beers there. Um, so there's no way that, that he's doing that. And if he says that, that malt quality is going, is going down, I'm going to take that as absolutely true. Um, yeah, so – but I don't know. I, I mean – the the tough part is is how do you how do you tell right I mean how do you, you is, unless somebody's got some malt that's been sitting around for three or four years that hasn't oxidized or hasn't like you know the, had its quality hit uh, how do you know and how do you test that you know I mean because the malts are hitting extract efficiencies right and so again the 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 every COA every certificate analysis is going to tell you how much extract you can get out of that malt. Um, the maximum amount that you can get out and then what you should expect to get out. It should tell you both of those numbers. And so that everybody, you know, so most commercial brewers at least are going to be looking at that and then changing their recipe based on every single certificate of analysis, which is different than homebrewers, right? Homebrewers don't care. You just go into the homebrew store and you're getting like, you know, pale, uh, pale malt and going home and saying, okay, I've got 10 pounds of pale malt. That means I should have a, an OG of 1055 or 1060 or whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's hard to say though if malt quality's actually gone down. But if Vinny says it has, I'm trusting him. Uh, yeah, and Ben put a paper down there about uh, a malt group that wrote a whole paper about distributors about how grain is coming with higher protein and lower extract due to drought. Mm, yeah, um, yeah that's interesting. So I, Maybe I should try to get them on uh, the brew lab. That'd be a fun one to talk about. Uh, and that was something that Vinny was saying is that due to like drought and and less water, they were getting less extraction. And if anybody has enough documented extraction data sheets it's probably Vinny Chalerzo he's been doing this for a long time and he mm -hmm. is again way smarter than I'll ever be about any of this so um mm -hmm. Alex asked if you had, want listeners to take away just one <laughs> thing from this meeting what would it be <laughs> nice tongue-in-cheek there Alex I don't know um I don't know I hope you enjoy brewosity <laughs> right it's kind of a take <laughs> That's the, that's the easiest Anything one. except from water. Anything except from water. I'll have the caveat. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. If I want if I want listeners to take away one thing. I don't know. I uh, just I hope that you enjoy the content that that you're getting from us. The Brew Lab, the Brew Lost podcast, all this stuff. I hope it's enjoyable and I hope it's making an impact on your brewery. There. That's the one thing I want people to take away. I hope I'm having an impact. Uh I definitely think that, that you and Bill are having an impact. There are things that I do. In fact, today is the first like 60 minute mash and 60 minute boil I've done in a brew day in a long time. And I'm sitting there <laughs> thinking, it's like, man, normally I'd shave at least half an hour off my brew day by now. This stinks. Mm -hmm. 
you're going to be doing a lot more 60 minute, 60 minute matches. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know when that's official, but we'll talk about that later. Mm. Um, yep. Uh, so over any other resource podcast episodes have been the best learning, digestible info can't be beat. So you're getting some love from Haven. Of course, Scott was giving me some love about the pod philosophy and brew lab about how they helped him draw and become improving as a new home brewer. So read in here, you got some love happening. Uh, and then Haven's also lamenting that he's going to have to order some Vista hops now from YVH because we all spend enough money from that place. That's for sure. Right. And unfortunately, I don't think you're going to be able to Haven. I think they sold out the y- the 20- 2021 crop. Um, so there's probably, unless, unless I'm, I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's all gone, but. Uh, I think 16 ounce bags are still available. The 2020 oh. crop is still available. Okay. All right. Oh, the 2020 crop. Two 2020, 16 ounce bags, $19 a pop. Almost a pound. All right. There we go. Yeah. So the 2021 crop is gone, but the 2020 crop is still there. Yeah. Mm, tempting. That, that, that would be fun to play with. Yeah. Um, so I know you just talked about lexicon uh, in your last brew lab. And one thing I really appreciated was when uh, you guys were talking about like the whole woody versus herbal versus some mm-hmm. of those things, because those get really uh, lost on me, even as a, as a taster, because they all kind of just kind of haze together. So mm-hmm. um, so it was just funny because Vista had herbal as one of its descriptors. And I'm like, oh, that's something I'll never pick up on. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm still not sure what herbal means. I mean, you know, but it it's tough. I mean, I guess it's that that like noble hop character. That's kind of what I describe it as. Or black tea, I guess, is the most common for me now these days. But yeah, those are tough. And that's a part of the Cicerone um, exam, right? I mean, that's one of the things that's cool about having gone through that is you have to uh, you have to check on those things, right? You've got to you got to figure out what herbal means versus tropical, and figure out if you can describe the beers. I mean, the Cicerone exam doesn't ask you to. I don't think I'll have to remember, but I don't think this was part of it. it. Doesn't ask you to like describe a beer or judge a beer. The BJCP's exam does, um, and so that's that's where it makes sense, and it's really important to know, right, what herbal is or what um, you know. What's the difference between lemon versus orange versus lime? I mean, those are those are hard ones for me too. I don't know that I can. I I think I can pick them out today, but I was not able to do that like five or six years ago. Well, and, and even grapefruit in that whole citrus category kind of gets blended mm-hmm. in a little bit there as well. Like I I think I know what grapefruit is versus lime, but the, but it all kind of citrusy character blends in pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like it's like we mentioned in there too. It's like citrusy character in beer versus like a straight lime or a straight grapefruit or something. So I mean, I think I mentioned this to Marshall. There was a blue owl beer called Teeny Hopper, which was a grapefruit sour beer. And I remember whenever we started tasting that, I was like, oh, I think this tastes like what was it that uh, Tim used to say in the Jersey and Tim reviews? Juniper. Uh, juniper. That's it. There you. go go yeah and i was like no nah, that's the same to me that's juniper because like, like i had a gin and i was like okay this has got juniper in it and i had teeny hopper and i'm like all right this has got cascade great this is actually got grapefruit puree in it these taste the same to me i was like i can totally see why you keep saying juniper because everything has cascade in it so that's gotta be it um and that was a that was a connection for me but again that's where i like develop a lexicon now so like anytime i think of like uh, grapefruit or i'm like oh that's got that likely cascade or it's got that like juniper floral character i'm like ah oh, maybe this beer has cascade in it, even though it's not like a grapefruit bomb so, so that's funny because i brewed like a uh just like a simple pale ale kind of an homage to sierra nevada with a bunch of cascade and the the one guy that tried it who was from um oh, where was he from somewhere in the northeast but he described it as juniper and that's the only other person i've heard describe a beer as juniper other than tim <laughs> maybe there's savants i mean i don't know maybe they maybe they know something that the rest of us don't i don't know i don't I mean, like grapefruit but i like cascade so i don't know uh have you ever had texas fresh ruby red grapefruits in the valley because those are pretty stellar i have not had texas fresh ruby red but i have had ruby red shiner <laughs> uh ruby red shiner tastes like ginger it does well, that's true yeah but it's got ruby red grapefruit in it yeah, I, I don't get that. I just get ginger, and I like ginger a lot, so I drink ruby red all the time. But like, it just tastes like ginger to me. Um, mm. 
So, so the only grapefruits I like are from the valley, and I got to get them up farm fresh off the side of the road in order to really enjoy them. So, that's the best way to buy buy food. Oh, that's an Oregon staple. There we go. Uh, how about fresh berries, like Marion berry? Do y'all know what a Marion berry is? Yeah, no, me either. I didn't know either. It's apparently an underripe blackberry, <laughs> but, but it's a it's called a Marion berry. Um, and that they have Marion berry jam up here, and I love that stuff. Marion berries are great. Um, by the way, there's blackberries and blueberries and strawberries everywhere up here. So it's like you can, I mean, blackberries especially. You can like walk down a trail anywhere. Um, and, well, not anywhere, but walk down a trail and just like pick blackberries as you're going down the trail. Just like snack on blackberries as walking down a trail on a hike. Ooh, Haven wants to know if there's any fruit beer experiments coming. Oh, that's a good idea. Maybe we should do some fruit beer experiments. Um, I'm not, I'm not a huge I well, yeah. I I mean I like fruit beers, uh, but I I usually like them in sour beers. I like sour fruited beers. Uh, would it be worthwhile to do like a uh, frozen versus fresh fruit mm. sour experiment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be good. Um, and actually, I had plans to do that a couple of years ago. So my dad has a Texas plums in West Texas, um, which are like the wild fruit of like West Texas. You can just walk out and, and get these plums. So we got like 60 pounds of plums after like an hour's worth of picking. Um, but I wanted to do that. And that's where I kept meaning to do that experiment because I want to grab the fresh plums. And then that's that's like the the single source, right? You like you know that like the fresh from plums are the same as the frozen plums because it controls that variable so we've talked about that that'd be a fun one to see if i can revisit i got to figure out a way to get texas plums to oregon but uh, i guess you could also just go to the store and buy a whole bunch of fresh raspberries mix them up and then freeze half freeze them yeah freeze them for a, a time or something yeah because that's I'd one of the things too even the like, other one fresh while the others freeze yeah exactly well yeah that's that's the point right how do you keep them fresh while the others are freezing you'd have to like fr flash freeze them yeah interesting i don't know maybe we could make something work because it's true too there's some science behind that right the 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 uh cells like lies and so they like they expand and the sugar crystals crystallize and and make that like sugar much more available although fruit is pretty much going to ferment 100 percent of the sugars i mean it's all fruit fructose and glucose in there so yeah but, but what remains behind is part of what gives you that flavor so you would think yeah. that like you know, breaking down those cell walls, maybe that gives it more access to sugar, but maybe less of the flavor sticks around, or, or maybe it's the opposite. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't go to school at Oregon State. In a, in a <laughs> well, Oregon. I'm still a fledgling, so I'm just barely a master's student. I've only been a master's student for three like, three months. So, uh, but yeah, well, Brian, that's an interesting one. Brian says impact of pectinase um, would be interesting. Yeah, to add pectinase versus not. Um, that'd be interesting too. Um, to see if there's a taste impact. I mean, clearly there's going to be a, a visual difference, or at least there should be a visual difference. But yeah, and, that'd be fun. and you could even do uh, frozen fruit that you, um, uh, blah, 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 not sanitized. What's the word? Reheated up, pasteurized versus unpasteurized. Oh yeah, Un frozen yeah, fruit. pasteurized frozen fruit versus un. Mm -hmm. that That's another one too. I want to do. Did we do the pasteurized versus unpasteurized honey yet? Um, y'all did one. When was it added? I think it was added during – yeah, because uh, I think it was a Jake one because I copied his Hellespock recipe mm. and added like two pounds of honey into a Hellespock, and that was mm. one of the most bomb diggity beers ever, and it got you hammered so fast. <laughs> I can imagine. It's basically like just dumping extract in there, <laughs> dumping sugar in. And, and what was great was is that uh, it tasted so clean and smooth, and so you, you felt like you could hammer three, four glasses, and then all mm. of a sudden you're just gone. <laughs> yeah. That's like a temptress. Lakewood used to make this beer. I think they still do if Lakewood's still around, but it was a Dallas brewery um, and it made this beer called temptress. It was a milk stout and that beer did not taste like a milk stout. It was like the most crushable beer and you could crush it, but it was 9% or nine and a half percent. So it's like you drink a milk stout and you're like, Oh good. Yeah. I'll have another one. You get like halfway through that next one. You're like, Whoa, <laughs> like I, did, I was not taking shots tonight. What happened? <laughs> That, that's awesome cool um yeah man anything else you want to share i don't want to take up too much of your time maybe you got to the end of that beer i got no idea what's your second beer that you're drinking there oh this is uh, so my mom recently sent me a care package 
So this is Dagum IPA from RAR. Ooh. RAR and Sons. The brewery, not the maltster. Although somewhat related. Have you had this one? I don't think I've drank that one specifically. RAR. Yeah. It's pretty good. It's an IPA. My, my mom sent me a, a Texas Care package, which didn't include any Blue Owl, but that's okay. Uh, she said, it's like all kinds of stuff. Like some all I got some Allstat beer. I got some different Shiners. I got some uh, some Shannon Brewing Company from up in McKinney. All kinds of good stuff from Texas, which was great because I, I've said it a bunch of times on the podcast. So like I walk in, I still walk into the grocery store and I don't know all of the beers and the, uh, you know at the grocery store. I'm still like I don't know. I've never had this beer. Let's try it and <laughs> see. That was not the case in Texas. Uh. Easy question. What's your desert island beer? Uh, desert island beer. If I could get enough of it, uh, Riesdorf Kolsch. Yeah, that's it. I could drink that every day, all day, as often as I as, as I needed to. I love that beer. And actually, I discovered that beer as part of the Cicerone study, trying a Kolsch versus what's the difference between like a Kolsch versus a lager or versus a Pilsner versus a Hellas. Um, yeah, so that was a fun one. Subtle. It's very subtle. So subtle, but it's so good. Um, although, you know, as I think about it, like from a health standpoint, if I had a desert island beer, I might want to drink like an athletic or like a victory wheat or something. That's just like a non-alcoholic beer so I can actually survive. Although I don't know if you're on a desert island, it's kind of like, well, screw it anyway. I might as well just be drunk all the time. Jack Sparrow, that shit. So, so the coolest answer ever was uh, somebody said Orval because Orval, because of the Brett, changes flavor constantly. So you'll oh. never have the same beer twice. And I'm like, oh, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Yeah. Never have the same beer twice. I don't know. I I'm, I have simple needs. I can drink the same beer. I'm a, I'm a beer-flavored beer guy. So, <laughs> so like, I can – I mean, shoot, if, even if it was, like, Bud Miller Coors, I would drink that one on the Desert Island. I don't care. Have you ever had an Orval, though? I have, yeah. I love or- Orval, yeah. Or, like, and uh, Orval aged out to a year is fantastic. Yeah, I so don't I- know. I don't know what the age was on it, but um, you know, Jester King. I used to live right next to Jester King, which is an Austin sour beer brewery. Uh, well, it's more like farmhouse. It's not sour beer. It's farmhouse. So they've got like a pedio cu- culture and lacto and uh, Brett and a whole bunch of other stuff and fruit barrels, all kinds of different things that they're doing. Um, but yeah, they, they served Orval and I had it a couple times whenever I was there. I, you know, I was disappointed the two times I had it though. It just tasted like, like gym sock, but I don't know. It's, um, it, it's better if you get it in Belgium, I'll tell you that much. Uh, and, it, <laughs> yep. and it, um, and it's better if you let it age six plus months mm. and, and cause but initially it has kind of a, a pungent flavor that's not as desirable, but then as it ages, it gets really cool. And the, and the breath that they used to condition it with, mm-hmm. um, starts to do more funky things. So, um, yeah, kind of speaking of blue owl back a bit, is there anything you learned from blue owl that you incorporated into your own home brewing, like how to kettle sour or, uh, yeah, definitely. So the kettle sour technique that I, I usually do, um, is like at 105 Fahrenheit, um, usually. Um, it, it depends on the, the bacteria, but yeah, it's 105 Fahrenheit is usually what I do it, and I let it sit for about 25 hours or 24 hours. Oh, I should have mentioned too, the way that Blue Owl got its culture originally is through this thing that that um, what's it, it's called the the Mu. Um, what does it do? Anyway, there's a sign on it that says this thing does science, which is great because it like you put some grain in there and you pass hot wort over it and it pulls like the, it's like essentially like doing a handful of grain to sour. So it pulls all those cultures out and then no- inoculates the whole beer. So it's a really cool device, um, even though they, they kind of keep the culture separate now. So they don't like they don't use the mu as much anymore. They just kind of keep the culture separate. But, yeah, that's definitely something that impacted my um, my brewing. Uh, the other thing. The two I think that impacted my brewing is I got exposed to Kvik while I was there, um, which I I really like Kvik um, in sour beers because I think you get this really fun flavor at higher temperatures in Kvik, um, and I think that's a really cool way to to um, explore some of those beers. 
Yeah. Is it a flavor reason that they use them, or can it handle sourness better than yeah. most yeast? I mean, I, I would say it, it for the beers that I saw it used on, it can definitely handle the sourness. So, like, especially because it has some of that, like, orangey Kvike character. And so that orangey character plays really well with the sour. But a really cool thing about it in a production brewery is you can turn around a beer in seven days. And for a production brewery, that's that's money. I mean, that's like, wow, if you can turn a beer around in seven days, holy moly. Yeah. I'd be I'd be interested to see if there's any papers on Kvike and handling pH because um, that's interesting because even like the Philly Sour guys they they talk a lot about co pitching or like not co pitching but like pitching your Philly Sour and then coming back and and pitching your Kvike later mm-hmm. just to speed up the fermentation process so obviously there is some pH handling ability there. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you know that one's an interesting one that Philly Sour yeast that's a really interesting one. Um, and one of the episodes I got the most like feedback on from, although I think uh, the Maria Mutsuglu's episodes have definitely taken the cake on that. The her two episodes, the one on like yeast wrangling, and then the most recent one on the uh, low uh, carbon and high nitrogen yeast starter. Um, yeah, those ones I think people have really been enjoying those. Um, but in any event, yeah, that Philly sour one was was cool, and it's interesting too because they just don't. There's so much that they don't yet know um, about how that yeast works. Yeah. Do you do any? Oh. Well, I, well, go ahead, Alex. <laughs> I was just you curious gotta... if you did any yeast wrangling yourself, or overbuilding, or starter building, or stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whenever I was first brewing, I mean, now with Imperial, I'm using mostly direct pitch from Imperial. But yeah, I, I did some of this. St- I I did a lot of starters. I mean, stir plates and and everything. Um, I did. I wasn't very good at cleaning yeast, so I didn't ever do any like rinsing and washing of my yeast. So I'd mostly just build like a vitality starter and then go from there, or like a vitality starter, harvest some of it, um, and then uh, you know use it later. Uh, but I didn't do. I wasn't usually like a a yeast collection person. But there is a brewer here in Corvallis uh, that I've gotten to know, uh, and he definitely uh, has a lot of different yeasts that he likes to keep in culture, and it's kind of fun to see how the yeast changes. I would say too, if you look at most commercial breweries, um, and there was even a paper about this, I think most commercial breweries are harvesting their yeast and reusing, and they don't like the outcomes from direct pitches. So that's another one that I would like to see um, that we could try to do. It's it, it's difficult because of brewlosophy restrictions, not because of imperial yeast or anything, but it's difficult because of like maintaining cell culture. But it's like, I wanna see like a direct pitch versus a like harvested yeast like three or four pitches down the road right so it's like it had does the yeast itself change or have you just infected the yeast with something else (laughs) it's kind of the question i'd love to see that but it's hard right because you can't like directly count the number of cells and like monitor and do plating and all this kind of stuff to make sure that the yeast doesn't change but that's one i'd really love to see and that's similar to conversations people have around Kvike, right? Because they're like talking about the isolates versus like the actual cultures that these people are using mm-hmm. in, in Norway. And so, um, so how do you get like a whole Kvike culture versus just the Voss isolate or whatever they're calling the Voss isolate? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, Lars Marius Garshall was talking to me about that on the brew lab. Um, and, and he was saying like, you know, most people, whenever you're getting uh, some yeast labs are doing isolates, but most aren't isolates. Right. If you're brewing Kvike in Norway, you're not getting a single yeast strain. So when he started calling these things like Voss, right, or or um, what are the other ones? I can't remember off the top of my hand, but Voss is a good example. When he started calling it Voss, it, it wasn't intended to mean one isolated strain of yeast. It was meant to be this is the pitch that's sort of stereotypical of this. And so what he started doing is – he stopped labeling yeasts based on region and he started labeling it based on family. So the yeast now carries the family name um, with it. And and so that's like, or like the culture carries the family name. So it's like, this is the Job culture or, or whatever, you know? Um, and, and, and so that's like the, the special name for each of those. So he still maintains a list of all the div- different Kvike cultures, which is really awesome. If you look at his website, you can still see all that. Uh, yeah, that, that's actually, if you haven't been to his site to see that, that's a really cool 
um, thing to go check out because he's doing I, I think he's doing a really amazing job of cataloging that just so it doesn't go the way of the dodo. Yeah. And I mean, it's like preserving history, right? I mean, it's just like preservation of Norwegian farmhouse trends, which is crazy to think. Like, I think I even asked him on the show. It's like, hey, we've been brewing beer for 3000 years. Why are we only talking about, you know, Norwegian farmhouse beers in like 2015, you know, or 2018? <laughs> it's it's crazy. And we I think we talked about it on the show a little bit, too. It's It's in the United States, especially we've like focused on this single ale strain beer right? One strain of yeast, but that, and because of German brewing influence and English brewing influence, but like in Belgium, they'll pitch multiple yeast strains. They don't give a crap. I mean, and, and if it tastes great, awesome, right? Like Philly sour, that's another great example. Maybe Philly sour does benefit when you pitch a flagship or something behind it. And I think, uh, I don't know if it was on your podcast or a different one. I heard Lars talk about it, but he was like, just saying that like, there's these farmhouse brewers that like, um, Awesome. I'm getting a refill. Uh, there's these farmhouse brewers that like are finally getting validation that, oh crap, we've been doing this for like centuries in our family, and we're finally getting validation that what we this tradition we've been doing, yeah. and that's that's amazing to me. That like that if that doesn't give you goosebumps that these farmhouse brewers have been doing this tradition forever <laughs> are finally getting validation because because there's nobody doing it that way anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it makes yeah. one apply to Horn and Doll and go to their festival. Hi, right, there you go. There's another strain or strain, right? Isolate. Yeah. A horn and doll. Yeah. That would be, yeah. That's, that's a, yeah. And it's cool, right? Like you're spotlighting history. It's like active history while, right while we're here. Um, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of places that have kept like, you know, their house culture or something for hundreds of years. I mean, a lot of the Trappist abbeys, well, you know, the Trappist beers will say that it's the same culture uh, for, for a hundred years. Uh, and maybe that's the case. I saw a weird study the other day that said that there was a, uh, uh, so like a bioreactor, like a yeast propagation tank at a commercial brewery that had been propagating the same yeast for 27 years. That doesn't usually happen. Usually like after 20 or 30 batches, they'll just dump the bioreactor and then put a new like yeast or a new fresh yeast strain that they've grown up from the lab in. But this one's just been propagating for like 27 years. And it said that there was no or there was no genetic mutation. It was exactly the same yeast. Um, that they they were still able to isolate, um, you know, twenty seven years later, which I thought was insane. Well, I thought a lot of the Trappists, not all of them, but I know like uh, I think uh, Westy West Flandern, they get it from West Mala. I think West Mala supplies a few of them because mm -hmm. West Mala, I think, has a pretty modern brew lab in their monastery, and so they kind of support a lot of the other um, Trappist monasteries. So they're like, but they're just like Reed, growing it up and then handing it off. Yeah. So, um, read brew like a monk. It's a great read if you're into mm. Trappist style beers and it gets a lot of good info. Um, but it's West Mala does support West D 12, West Fondren 12, the greatest, the greatest beer in all of the world, according to uh, a couple <laughs> of websites. And, and it is a, it's a great beer. I've had it. It's fantastic. Um, but uh, they get their yeast from West Mala, and supposedly St. Bernardus, which you can get even in the States now, took the original West Fondren strain, and that's what – whenever they got it off the monastery initially, and then whenever uh, West Fondren took it back over, they started sourcing from West Mala. Mm. So – Interesting. Curious yeah. these things. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, Belgians have also always been ex exploratory with beer, which has been awesome. I mean, it's super fun. And that's cool too that West Mall is like supporting those other abbeys, right? Oh man, and they're um and, and West Mall at Triple to me is not my favorite triple, but it is like kind of the standard. Mm. It's like bluebell ice cream, bluebell homemade vanilla in Texas. <laughs> it's standard vanilla. There's some better, there's some worse, but it's the standard. Bluebell homemade ice cream. I'm not gonna sing on the on this, but yeah, I love bluebell. I miss bluebell too. Miss that as well the ice cream up here is different it's like more thick there's more like i don't know it's more creamy whereas the ice ice cream in texas is more airy or something and light i don't know miss cheaper. that cheaper yeah uh, h-e-b i miss h-e-b too that's <sighs> that's definitely <laughs> definitely a miss from texas but that's yes. h-e-b ice cream flavor question oh uh texas two-step mm. mm-hmm did you ever get to have the Mexican hot chocolate before you left, though? Oh, yeah. Mexican hot chocolate's great, too. Yeah. 
Mexican vanilla. Texas two step is really easy. It's just cookie dough and Oreos. It's my nice. favorite. <laughs> Can we uh, get your chocolate chip recipe? <laughs> so I, I I generally rotate. I don't have like one that I I brew, I use all the time. But yeah, I mean it's it's probably pretty standard. Although I'm a little heavy on the brown sugar. Um, so I'll, I'll usually use like a cup of brown sugar and a half a cup of white sugar, where I think most recipes are like three quarter, three quarter. Um, the other thing too is, is keep your ingredients warm or like at room temperature. Don't make cookies if you don't have room temperature ingredients. Especially things like butter. Yeah. Butter and eggs. Keep the eggs too. Cause the content of the eggs can actually change and also spoon and level your flour. Don't dip your measuring cup into the flour and then like pull it up cause it'll compact it compacts the flour. So take a big like tablespoon and spoon into the measuring cup and then level it off. That'll get the consistent amount of flour every time. So this is going to sound silly, but like um, a- after, I think it was, it was a Brulossi podcast listened to where they use like regular bread, like yeast uh-huh. beer versus like a, a normal strain. Yeah. Uh, it's normal sac- beer yeast. And so they're both Saccharomyces yeast cerevisiae, right? And mm-hmm. so after released that podcast, because me and baking have a love hate relationship, and so I was like, well, you know, it's all sac cerevisiae, so I should be able to bake bread because it's all fermentation. It's all sac cerevisiae. I should be able to wrangle this crap. Yeah, exactly right. And well, and and interestingly too, there's like there's all these you know Saccharomyces cerevisiae is is in bread, right? Like you said, but there's also like other yeasts, like that that most recent one from like from Brian Gibson where we did Torulospora delbrecii, which is a sourdough yeast. Uh, but but that that experiment was nuts. The Brian did that, and I remember like I remember the the chats leading up to that, where he's like he brewed the beer, and it's like the first day he's tasted it, and he's like, "Y'all, this tastes the same." And we're like, "It's bread yeast." No, it doesn't. And like you're like, "Come on, Brian." Uh, but but he 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 served it to tasters. And yeah, it was. Have um, you done a sourdough beer? Uh, not sourdough. No, no. This was the this was the one you were talking about. That was the sour yeah. the the uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, um, I've done a sourdough culture beer. My wife has a oh. sourdough culture, and I and I totally brewed like a Berliner Weiss kind of recipe, expecting it to go sour or do something funky. Mm. It tastes like a loaf of bread. Yeah, it's got. Oh, it tastes like bread. It actually tastes like bread, or did it taste yeah. like beer? No, it, it like like it was like the bread version of beer because it was it was just a simple Berliner Weiss had a lot of wheat malt. Yeah, it it tastes like drinking a loaf of bread to me. Oh yeah, yeah. I bet it did. It, it was the cleanest thing ever. It had like a sour hint on the nose, and then you're just like, "What the crap?" Like I expected this to go crazy <laughs> sour. I was like trying to do anything. I started dry hopping it to make it taste like something. <laughs> Add some lacto in. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get there. Cool. Mm-hmm. Well, dude, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. It's already seven forty-five. Yeah. We're dwindling down, so I'm I'm happy to hang out. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna take this opportunity. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna head out and um, go uh, start cooking dinner for the fam. Well, you're awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate chatting with you. It's been informative. I've really enjoyed it. I know for all of us that have stuck around, we've really enjoyed it. Everybody singing your praises in the chat for Brew Lobby <laughs> and Brew Lab. So uh, obviously, you're you're making an impact on at least those of us in the Brew Club, and we we appreciate hearing your story, man. Well, sweet. I appreciate it, guys, and thanks for inviting me to come on. Rock on. All right. See y'all. Bye. Thanks, guys. I'm going to hop off, too. All right.